The latest demographic data by Korea's statistics agency shows an unsettling shift in the country's youth population in less than 30 years. So what are the broader repercussions of this reality? What factors are fueling the fall in youth population? And what can be done to reverse it? Welcome to Wednesday's edition of Issues and Insiders. Today we address an alarming demographic phenomenon here in this country. For more, I have Professor Kim Joon at the KDI School of Public Policy and Management. Professor Kim, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me. I also have Kwon Soa with us. Soa, welcome back. Hello, Sunny. Straight off, Soa, let's begin with details about the disturbing data on our youth population. I believe in fewer than 30 years. Right. Uh, the youth uh, population in the country, which according to the data that we will be looking at, refers to those aged 19 to 34, is diminishing at a fast pace. So uh, that's what Statistics Korea found in its analysis of changes in the youth generation in South Korea based on the population and housing census from 2000 to 2020. So let's take a look at the youth population in the past decades here. The most recent figure we have from the data released last week is 10.21 million people in the 19 to 34 age bracket as of 2020. That's a little over 20 percent of Korea's total population. This is a continuous downward trend since 1990 when the youth population stood at 13.85 million, which accounted for almost 32 percent of the entire population. Now what's more, by year 2050, the figure is expected to have from the current number to a mere 5.2 million, equivalent to 11 percent of the country's population. Along with the declining number of young people, the analysis also showed a drop in married people among the youth. Uh, to take a closer look at that, let's go over the number of unmarried people aged between 19 and 34 again. So again, starting with the most recent number in 2020, 7.84 million did not tie the knot with someone, which is over 81 percent of the total youth population. Two decades before, in year 2000, 6.46 million were unmarried, which was a little over 54 percent of the youth population. Since then, we see a steady increase in unmarried people in this age group. And uh, what the study also revealed was a record low fertility rate of 0.7 children as of the third quarter of 2023, a hike in economically active young women, but also a decline in men that have a job in that age bracket and a rapidly aging population. Right, I see. And all this being said, Professor Kim, what would be the broader repercussions of such a reality that is of having our youth population shrink by half by the year 2050? Mm -hmm. The shrinking youth population comes with a series of side effects. And one critical issue is the rising dependency ratio, which is the number of dependents, such as children and elderly population to the working age population. So increase in dependency ratio implies that a decreasing number of young population have to share the burdens of supporting a rapidly growing elderly population. And of course, this puts significant strain on social welfare systems, such as pension and health care and other benefits. And government in the near future will be struggling to fund and sustain these programs. And it's likely that a substantial proportion of South Korean population will not be covered by these basic social benefits. And of course, limited government resources is likely to lead political conflict potentially between young and older generations over the scarce resources. And um, I believe the government and policymakers should be prepared for these negative upcoming consequences. And I view that um, this trend as a pretty concerning. Right, of course. And before we delve into the policies necessary to perhaps reverse this trend, what do you believe are the reasons behind this rampant retreat in Korea's youth population? Mm. The key factor, of course, is the decline in fertility rates, uh, rapidly declined fertility rates in Korea. Total fertility rates in Korea, which is the average number of uh, expected children uh, that women give birth during their reproductive years, is below one. 
to maintain population size in high income country, total fertility rate should be around 2.1 and current fertility rate rates in Korea is well below this replacement level. And since 2020, South Korea has witnessed a natural decline in population size. And you might think that, oh, this is common in other high income country with low fertility rates, but it's not common phenomenon in other high income countries, even those with very extremely low fertility rates. Um, this is because many other Western countries are now accepting a growing number of immigration, uh, which offset population decline due to fertility rates, uh, fertility decline. However, this is not happening in South Korea. So it's the combination of declining in fertility rates and limited migration inflow that uniquely shape rapid decline in young population size in South Korea. Right. Well, Korea's fertility rate has been standing well below one in recent years. And so I understand parenthood is not the only thing that these youth are shying away from. They're also, like you mentioned earlier, shunning the institution of marriage itself. Could you tell us a bit more about this? Right. Uh, more and more young people in Korea see no need in having to get married. A report released earlier this year said only 36.4 percent of people aged 19 to 34 had a positive perception of marriage in 2022. And uh, that's a plunge from 56.6 percent a decade before. The figure in particular is low among women, with just 28 percent feeling positive towards marriage. While reasons like not having enough money to get married and shunning away from childbirth are named, for women, the so-called opportunity cost of marriage plays a big factor as well with women's advancement in education and their career. But uh, while the number of people who want to get married is declining, given the urgency in having to deal with a rapid aging society, 8 out of 10 Koreans were found to be for the introduction of various kinds of different marriage systems. According to a recent survey conducted by the Presidential Committee on Aging Society and Population Policy, together with the Culture Ministry, one solution that uh, close to 77 percent of respondents had a positive perception of was the French PAX system, which recognizes couples without having to be in a legal partnership, but provides them with certain rights and benefits that legally married couples receive. And also uh, almost 40 percent, 39.4 percent respondents had a positive view towards uh, immigration policies, which would also, you know, help us spur marriage and also the um, fertility rate. So although they themselves, uh, many of the young people uh, think uh, marriage is not needed, they are for such policies that would increase the overall uh, marriage number in the country. Right. And staying with us, so what can you share with us about the reality based on the young people around you? Well, Sonny, um, I do not fit into the 19 to 34 category, so I don't know whether I would be the best person to talk about the young people around me. But I do have to say, because I have a lot of uh, freelance uh, friends uh, that are in broadcasting, uh, emceeing and so on. So many of uh, especially the uh, women concentrate on their career first and then uh, some of them choose to not marry. But then uh, others, actually, they want to marry after they are kind of stabilized uh, in their job, but then later on they fi find it a little too difficult to find uh, their, you know, person for their life because of their age. So I think that is a kind of dilemma uh, that I also see around me. Right. And expanding on what Soa has just said, Professor Kim, employment instability perhaps and housing insecurity as well as, of course, the, uh, the challenges of child rearing have been highlighted as some reasons for the youth choosing to shun marriage. What more can you tell us about these three huddles? Yeah, one thing to remember is entering into marriage and parenthood is often perceived as a lifelong commitment. But like you mentioned, the contemporary labor market poses a significant challenges for young adults. So in the current labor market, even if you're making a good amount of income, there's no guarantee that you can maintain the current job or current level of salary. And a lot of young adults feel that they cannot even take care of themselves financially. And of course, taking care of somebody else, which is family, is a luxury. And simultaneously, the institution of marriage and relationship itself has become precarious as well. In contrast to the past, divorce is now more socially accepted and many marriages end up being divorced. So for this reason, many young people view marriages even not as secure life choices as well. 
And uh, like you mentioned, addressing child rearing adds another complexity to this issue, particularly in the context of South Korea, where cultural pressure to produce high quality children is very high for both women and men. So raising a children means for women in Korea is uh, adding more and more time at home at the expense of their career. And for men is putting more and more time uh, to their workplace. And these expectations coupled with insecure labor market and the marital insecurity contribute to the perception that starting a family for young adults are risky choice. Right, and perhaps staying with that, so I believe there's a separate survey that shows a link between economic insecurity and birth rates, right? Right, Korea's central bank on Sunday released a report that warns if the country fails to find a solution regarding the low birth rate, uh, being the lowest in the world, of course, uh, South Korea's growth rate may plunge to below 0% by 2050. There's a 68% uh, chance that that could happen, according to uh, the uh, report. And also 2050 uh, being the point when, according to current predictions, the youth population falls to some 5 million, as I mentioned before as well. So the Bank of Korea forecasted the entire nation's population to fall below 40 million by 2070, uh, that uh, having a 90% probability. These are all frightening projections, but which are made when factoring out any government interventions, meaning the report is calling for new resolutions. This as it cites employment, housing and child care as the key causes to the unprecedented low birth rate. Uh, in fact, just to mention again, uh, between July and the September period, the growth rate was at 0 0.7, down 0 0.1 from the same quarter last year. Uh, delving deeper into this problem, competition among the youth is being highlighted uh, by this report as a major problem. It cites figures that say the more young people feel pressured by competition, the lower was the number of children they wanted. While almost half of employed people intended to get married, the percentage was at around 38 percent among non-employed. It was also interesting to find that non-regular workers figure was even lower at 36.6 percent. The central bank with that stressed the need for measures to raise employment rates among unmarried young people, lower living prices and also ease urban concentration because many young people who live in the rural areas, they feel like they have to uh, go and work in the Seoul metropolitan area for them to succeed. So that's why also uh, that also has got to do with the competition, the pressure that they feel of the competition that then again leads to a lower birth rate. Right. It's like a vicious cycle. Mm. So instead of starting their own families. I understand quite a number of young people are also choosing to move back into their parents' home. Exactly. So we heard a lot about the term kangaroo tribes, uh, which refers to adults that are old enough to be independent uh, but from their parents but choose to live uh, at their parents' place until they get a job or get married, if they do, that is, due to living costs they cannot afford. Now, a study published earlier this year showed 57.5% of grown-ups lived with their parents and 67.7% of these said they currently have no detailed plans on moving out. For those in their 20s and 30s, unemployment is a big factor, but there has also been a rise in those categorized into the NEAT tribe, those who are not currently engaged in education, employment or training, so not looking for a job at all. There are also different types of kangaroo tribes. The new kangaroo tribe, referring to those, uh, although that's even not a new term anymore, it refers to those who do have a job but still choose to live with their parents, and to those who once moved out but returned to their parents' home. That's also what uh, Sunny earlier mentioned, I believe. The red to root tribe, that's referring to return plus kangaroo tribe, or they are also referring to as boomerang kids. So they uh, return to their homes after having moved out once. And high interest rates, inflation, etc., have been cited as reasons for such. Even kangaroos in their 40s are growing. In fact, 48.8%, almost half of unmarried people in their 40s, live with their parents, according to a report by the Korea Institute for Health and Social Affairs. Right. And apart from those who choose to return to their homes, Professor Kim, we are also seeing a a greater presence of single person households. What can you tell us about the broader social implications of this particular reality?
I personally find no issue with living alone houses, but one aspect that does concern me is social isolation. So a lot of scientific research consistently show that prolonged social isolation significantly contributes to mental health issues such as depression and anxiety. And moreover, some studies even show that enduring loneliness may even lead to a decline in life expectancy. Um, I recently had a chance to look into the recent data set on a representative sample of young population in Seoul, and I find that nearly 6% of young adults in Seoul have never left home for more than three weeks. And this is not for COVID-related reason, for, but for other personal reason. And this particular segment of the population is often called undunhyeong wetori in Korean or hikikomori in Japanese. And uh, these statistics underscore the urgency of addressing social isolation issue, especially among the young population, and also implementing strategies to foster meaningful connections and community engagements for overall well-being of the youth population. And staying with that, Professor Kim, what more can you tell us about the policies to, to promote a productive community of, of healthy young adults choosing perhaps to start their own families? So there are many ways to tackle this issue. And one of the most generic answer is, of course, providing more secure jobs to young adults. And but here, I would like to emphasize that workplace have to promote work life friendly policies. A lot of young people or general people argue that family friendly policies such as parental leave are critical in upturning fertility rates in South Korea. However, as evident in the case of South Korea, a country where parental schemes and benefits is one of the most generous in the world, um, this has not been so much effective for multiple reasons. And one of the critical reasons is that key contributor to low fertility, extremely low fertility at the current level is young adults not getting married at all. However, family-friendly policies at the workplace are directly specifically to support employees with family responsibilities, so often leaving single population left behind. So workplace now have to consider supporting work-life balance for young adults. And in South Korea, there is a numerous statistic showing that a lot of young adults are working long hours without overwork premium and experience emotional exhaustion, which keeps them from even dating and sustaining long-term relationship, which is critical for marriage. So in my research, I find a significant share of young adults who decided to never marry in the future reported that the reason is they're just too tired to date or marry. So I believe the workplace have to recognize that employees have other demands outside work and employees uh, securing employees work life balance, especially for single uh, employees through flexible work hours and schedules so they can have energy and time to dedicate in relationship and family is critical. Right, I see. So this is an impromptu question. Based on what Professor Kim has just said, do you suppose job security or perhaps a greater sense of work-life balance, based on these two only, which one would ensure that younger people would perhaps choose to start a family, get married, or even be involved in relationships? Either work-life balance or, or job security. Job security. Wow, that's difficult. If I think of the so-called MZ generation these days, I would rather say work-life balance, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Very difficult question. It really is, it really is. And, and keeping in mind the, uh, the uh, idea of young people, Professor Kim, there was a lawmaker who claimed that television shows that promoted the adventures of single life, as well as uh, dramas that focused on the rampant presence of infidelity were perhaps to blame for the reason of young people choosing not to get married. What are your thoughts? I think that there's no scientific evidence to argue that such program exposure to such information actually changed people's attitudes uh, towards divorce and um, marriage. And that requires scientific evidence to support this argument. So I wouldn't buy that argument. And uh, at the same time, I think that such reality shows and TV show reflects the cultural tendency that society become more acceptive of divorce and new forms of life, including living alone and diverse family arrangements, which is uh, including one parent household or um, other diverse family formation. So I think it reflects cultural shift, not that it's creating new cultural tendency. 
Right, and talking about a cultural shift, we ha covered this in our newscast earlier on, Soa, but there are efforts by the government here to ensure the mental health of the youth, mm -hmm. not just their uh, shrinking population, of course. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Right, uh, this is uh, pretty um, recently. The government has on Tuesday rolled out a comprehensive plan to you know, um, take care of the mental health of the young population. So what they are going to do is... Uh, for those Koreans aged 20 to 34, there will be checkups every two years is uh, what I see. And uh, this is actually pretty significant because the country did have such a system, but uh, that was a checkup every 10 years for those aged 20 to 70. So that would be kind of too late for young people if they only get these checkups every 10 years. And in fact, we know that the suicide rate is among the highest uh, in the world and also among the OECD countries. So this is the first time that at a policy, a state policy level that we're having these checkups. So uh, let's do hope that uh, this will expand later into all kinds of age groups that we can, you know, have checkups for ourselves uh, regularly. Because um, in Korea, many people uh, hesitate in going to uh, these uh, mental institu institutions, uh, whereas in Western countries, people have their own therapist. It's a normal thing. But I think if we have this at a government level, it would be much easier to, you know, prevent mental illness such as um, you know, uh, de uh, depression, depression, of and, course, and right. then that could even lead to suicide. Right, and of course the plan is to to slash the suicide rate by half within 10 years here mm -hmm. in the country. All right, so as always, thank you very much for, f thank you very much for your insight. That's My pleasure. It. And Professor Kim, thank you so much for your time and your thoughts today. Thank you. Right, well, that is all the time for this edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching. See you same time tomorrow.